Okay, this is part four, the final part of A Country Defeated in Victory by James Montgomery. House Resolution 31. Whereas it has been charged, and there is reason to believe, that a shortage of currency and a monopoly of credit exists in the United States, and that the power to control the issue of the public currency, which is one of the sovereign powers of the United States government, has been given over to private interests, and that the said private interests have abused that power and have been guilty of unlawful practices in connection with it, and have unlawfully extended credit to themselves and to foreigners and foreign central banks at the expense of and to the great injury of the people of the United States, and that by reason of such practices the people and the government of the United States have suffered great financial losses, and, whereas, although the law requires a certain agency of the United States government to fix an interest rate, on all issues of the public currency, advanced at the request of the aforesaid private interests, and requires that the aforesaid private interests shall pay such interest charges to the United States government, it has been charged, and there is reason to believe, that this law has, for seventeen years, been deliberately disobeyed, and that the government and the people of the United States have thereby been deliberately defrauded of immense sums of money, and that such sums of money are due to the government from the aforesaid private interests, and, whereas it has been charged, and there is reason to believe that vast profits which have been made in times past by the private interests to whom was farmed out the great privilege of controlling the currency of the United States, have not been properly accounted for, and that the knowledge of such profits has been concealed from the people by bookkeeping devices, and that the legal share of such profits belonging to the government has not been in its entirety set aside or paid over to the government, but has, on the contrary, been used speculatively by the said private interests for their own benefit, and that the published reports of the said private interests are not acceptable to the people of the United States, and should be examined by the representatives of the people. And whereas it has been charged, and there is reason to believe, that although it is unlawful to accept time drafts and bills of exchange drawn upon them, and by permitting national banks to buy and sell with their endorsement time drafts, bills of exchange and trade acceptances, and by rulings to the effect that such circulating evidences of debt including those drawn in dollars by foreigners for their own purposes, are rediscountable here and purchasable here in the open discount market and may be used by the aforesaid private interests as collateral security for new issues of United States currency. Great losses have been inflicted upon the government and the people of the United States, the government having unwisely been made the guarantor of that particular kind of currency, and that such losses have and are now being paid by the exportation of gold, and whereas it has been charged and there is reason to believe that although the original provision of law for the issue of currency on the security of time drafts or bills of exchange to be used in financing the importation of goods, contemplated goods, which were to be imported into or exported out of the United States, 
the fact that the words United States were omitted from the law gave excuse for a ruling which extends this provision to time drafts and bills of exchange financing goods imported and exported by foreign countries from and to foreign countries and that this provision has been extended to cover time drafts and bills of exchange financing goods in domestic shipment or stored in domestic warehouses and to time drafts and bills of exchange financing goods belonging to foreigners or others which are stored in foreign warehouses and has likewise been extended to cover time drafts and bills of exchange drawn to finance goods shipped between two or more foreign countries and to time drafts and bills of exchange not related to goods of any character by merely designed to furnish cheap exchange to foreigners and that all such time drafts and bills of exchange have been made collateral security for United States currency which the United States government is obligated to redeem in gold, and that great losses have been inflicted upon the government and the people of the United States by reason of these rulings and extensions, by the abuse of acceptance privileges, and by the use of such time drafts and bills of exchange as collateral security for United States currency, and whereas it has been charged, and there is reason to believe that, although the original provision of law, under which the private interests aforesaid, assumed power to control the issue of the public currency, inaugurated the use of a new currency based solely on notes and bills accepted for rediscount, the private interests aforesaid had Amendments added to existing laws giving them power to use each and every kind of debt paper purchasable in the open discount market as collateral security for new issues of the United States currency and that by means of these and other vicious amendments to existing law the government of the United States has been put in debt by the aforesaid private interests indiscriminately in all parts of the world as the enforced backer of private debtors and that the government has thus been made the backer of swindlers, smugglers, and speculators and that low elements in all nations have been allowed to operate on the public credit of the United States government, supplemented by the bank deposits of the American people, and that immense losses have thereby been inflicted upon the government and the people, and, whereas the reserves of the national banks have been confiscated and impounded in a central pool and placed under the control of the aforesaid private interests, and it has been charged, and there is reason to believe, that the said private interests have drawn immense sums of gold out of the said reserves belonging to our national bank depositors, and have lent such sums to foreign central banks, and have lost other such sums in speculative enterprises, and have transferred other such sums in gold to themselves and their foreign principles, thus requiring the continuous replenishment of the reserves in the pool at the expense of the American public, and to the great injury of the government and the people, and that the said private interests have established control and operate for their private benefit by means of their control of the said pool of confiscated bank reserves belonging to our national bank depositors, and that they use United States government obligations unlawfully in the operating of the said discount market, and that they have made the New York Stock Exchange and other exchanges adjuncts of the said discount market, 
and that by reason of their control of the discount market, they control the entire money market of the United States, all money rates, including the call money rate, the prices of all stocks and bonds on the exchanges, the prices of all commodities, the wages of all our people, and the value of all property, both real and personal. And whereas it has been charged, and there is reason to believe that by permitting certain banks in the United States to become the agents of foreign central banks, the wealth of the United States has been conveniently placed at the disposal of the said foreign banks and their customers, and that property belonging to American citizens has been taken from them without their knowledge and consent, and without due process of law, and that such property has been exported to foreign lands for the benefit of foreign central banks and their customers, and that such property has likewise been exported to foreign lands to satisfy debts incurred by the aforesaid private interests, and that such property belonging to the bank depositors of the United States is now being exported to satisfy claims held by foreigners against other foreigners in default, the aforesaid private interests having abused their power over the public currency so as to make the United States government the backer of the defaulters, and that other such property belonging to the people of the United States is likewise being exported to finance foreigners in competition with American producers, and for other purposes, and whereas it has been charged, and there is reason to believe, that the division of the United States into arbitrary financial areas has violated the principle of the sovereignty of the separate states of the Union, and has diminished the importance and hindered the growth of certain states, and threatens the financial stability of such states by making it possible for the resources of such states to be drawn outside of their border and exported to foreign lands, and whereas it has been charged and there is reason to believe that the aforesaid private interests have injured our foreign trade, reduced our trade balances, adversely affected the prices of our goods and commodities, and have benefited foreigners and themselves at the expense of the government and the people of the United States, and have financed foreign countries, cities, towns, public utilities, banks, corporations, and individuals with funds belonging to American bank depositors, and that blocks of bonds and stocks issued by foreign governments, cities, railroads, industrial corporations, and the like, have had debentures issued against them for sale to American investors, and that foreign securities of small value or of doubtful value and of no marketability abroad have thus been sold to American investors to the extent of billions of dollars at a great profit to the aforesaid private interests and to foreigners, but to the great loss of American investors, and that mass credits have been opened in the United States for foreign interests and have been withdrawn from the United States by means of drafts drawn in dollars rediscountable here or purchasable here in the open market and paid for in gold taken from our national bank reserves or in United States currency, redeemable in gold upon demand, and that corporations have been accorded extraordinary privileges, including the right to incur liabilities equal to ten times their capital stock and surplus, and that these and other corporations have been instrumental 
in having questionable foreign acceptances drawn in dollars rediscounted here and purchased here and used as collateral security for United States currency, and that there has been an abuse of acceptance facilities in the United States and an abuse of open market privileges and an abuse of government funds and obligations and an abuse of the public currency. And, whereas there is a decrease of business and industry in the United States and thousands of business enterprises have failed and the owners thereof have been forced into bankruptcy and thousands of banks have been obliged to close their doors with a resultant loss to American bank depositors of several billions of dollars, and wage earners by the millions have been thrown out of employment, and a condition of widespread misery, want, and suffering has been created among the people of the United States, and a breaking up of American homes and families has taken place, and a dispersal of American children has occurred which has removed them from the care of their natural protectors, and there is an unprecedented condition of crime and disrespect on the part of certain elements in the population for law and duly constituted authority, all of which is said to betoken an economic and financial crisis in the affairs of the nation, and it has been charged that there is reason to believe that this crisis has been caused by the conditions set forth herein, and other graver irregularities, crimes, and abuses, and Whereas it has been charged, and there is reason to believe, that the independent United States Treasury has been destroyed, and its functions taken over by the private interests which control the public currency, and that public monies raised from the people by taxation have been used speculatively, and that such funds have been improperly secured and losses and abuses have occurred in connection with them, and that irregularities have been disclosed in the accounts of the War Finance Corporation, and that government obligations have been unlawfully used to control the money market for the benefit of the aforesaid private interests and their foreign principles, and whereas there is a deficit in the estimated receipts of the United States Treasury, and it has been charged, and there is reason to believe, that a proper scrutiny and examination of the accounts of the fiscal agents of the government and of the United States Treasury and all related matters is necessary in order to safeguard the rights of the people and... Whereas it has been charged, and there is reason to believe, that the monetary, financial, banking, and currency laws of the United States have been evaded, maladministered, disregarded, abused, and disobeyed, and that private interests have made false representations, and have thereby obtained laws and amendments to existing laws, and illegal and unfair rulings for their own benefit and financial profit at the expense of the government and the people of the United States, and that the proper framing emendation, administration, and impartial execution of the banking and currency laws of the United States are matters of vital concern to we the people of the United States, and Whereas legislation is now pending, involving important changes in our banking, currency, and monetary systems, and vitally affecting the federal government and the United States Treasury, United States Foreign Trade and Commerce, United States Foreign Relations, our national banks and other financial institutions, and bills have been introduced 
having for their purpose the amendment of the act generally known as the Federal Antitrust Law, and whereas it is deemed advisable to investigate the monetary, banking, currency, and fiscal affairs of the United States in their entirety, and to gather the facts bearing on the aforesaid conditions, and chargers, or in any way relating thereto, or to any of the subjects above mentioned, as a basis for remedial and other legislative purposes, therefore be it resolved that the Speaker of the House of Representatives be, and is hereby, authorized to appoint a special committee consisting of five members, and such substituted members as may be from time to time selected by him to fill vacancies, if any occur, in the special committee, and that the said special committee is authorized and directed to fully investigate and to inquire into each and all of the above recited matters and into all matters and subjects connected with or appertenant to, or bearing upon the same, be it further resolved that said committee as a whole, or by subcommittee, is authorized to sit during the sessions of the House and during the recess of Congress. Its hearings shall be open to the public. The committee as a whole, or by subcommittee, is authorized to hold its meeting both during the sessions of Congress and throughout the recesses and adjournment thereof, and in such cities and places in the United States, as it may from time to time designate, to employ counsel, experts, accountants, bookkeepers, clerical, and other assistants may summon and compel the attendance of witnesses, may send for persons and papers, and administer oaths to witnesses. The Comptroller of the Currency, the Secretary of the Treasury, the Director of the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, the Director of the Mint, the Head of the Department of Commerce, the Secretary of State, the Interstate Commerce Commission, the President of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and their respective assistants and subordinates are hereby respective departments to procure for the committee from time to time such information as is subject to their control or inspection and to allow the use of their assistance for the making of such investigations with respect to matters under their respective jurisdiction, as the committee or any subcommittee may from time to time request. Such committee shall take such testimony, have such printing and binding done, and make such expenditures as it deems necessary, and be it further resolved that no person shall be excused from giving testimony or from answering any question or from otherwise disclosing any fact within his knowledge as an individual or as a member of a board, an officer or director of a bank, corporation or otherwise, or from producing any book, paper or document on the ground that giving of such testimony or the production of such book, paper or document would tend to incriminate him, or for any other reason. It shall be within the power of the committee or subcommittee to grant immunity from prosecution with respect to any matter or thing concerning which he may be interrogated, and as to which he shall truthfully make answer under oath upon such investigation. The Speaker shall have authority to sign and the clerk to attest subpoenas during the recess of Congress. I have asked the Committee on Rules 
for a hearing on this resolution and hope to get favorable action on it in a short time. An investigation will disclose that our president had sufficient reasons to say that the money changers should be driven from the temple. A call for impeachment. May 23, 1933. Impeachment charges. Oh boy, our would-be hero. He was a hero. Congressman McFadden. This is, these are the words of Congressman McFadden. Lewis McFadden. Mr. Speaker, I rise to a question of constitutional privilege. On my own responsibility as a member of the House of Representatives, I impeach Eugene Meyer, <laughs> former member of the Federal Reserve Board. Wow, no wonder they assassinated Lewis McFadden. I impeach Ron Meyer, former member of the Federal Reserve Board. Roy Young, a former member of the Federal Reserve Board. Edmund Platt, former member of the Federal Reserve Board. Eugene R. Black, member of the Federal Reserve Board and officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. Adolf Casper Miller, member of the Federal Reserve Board. Charles S. Hamlin, member of the Federal Reserve Board. George R. James, member of the Federal Reserve Board. Andrew W. Mellon, of the Federal Reserve Board. Ogden L. Mills, former Secretary of the United States Treasury and former ex officio member of the Federal Reserve Board. William H. Wooden, Secretary of the United States Treasury and ex officio member of the Federal Reserve Board. John W. Pohl, former Comptroller of the Currency and former ex officio member of the Federal Reserve Board. Why aren't we taught about Lewis McFadden, this congressman, and the kind of guts this guy had? What a stud! He had the, the guts to come out and <laughs> call for impeachment of these money changers? Wow! He goes on. J.F.T. O'Connor, Comptroller of the Currency and ex of Fisio, member of the Federal Reserve Board. F. H. Curtis, Federal Reserve Agent of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. J. H. Case, Federal Reserve Agent of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. R. L. Austin, Federal Agent of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. George DeCamp, Former Federal Reserve Agent of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. L. B. Williams, Federal Reserve Agent of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. W. W. Hoxton, Federal Reserve Agent of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. Oscar Newton, Federal Reserve Agent of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. E. M. Stevens, Federal Reserve Agent of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. J. S. Wood, Federal Reserve Agent of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. J. N. Payton, Federal Reserve Agent of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. M. L. McClure, Federal Reserve Agent of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. C. C. Walsh, Federal Reserve Agent of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. Isaac B. Newton, Federal Reserve Agent of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, jointly and severally, of high crimes and misdemeanors. And I offer the following resolution. Whereas I charge the aforesaid Eugene Meyer, Roy Young, Edmund Platt, Eugene R. Black. All right, you guys get, he's going to list all these guys' names again. Whereas I charge these people, all Federal Reserve agents, jointly and severally, with violations of the Constitution and laws of the United States, and whereas I charge them with having taken funds from the United States Treasury, which were not appropriated by the Congress of the United States, and I charge them with having unlawfully taken over eighty billion dollars from the United States government in the year 1928, 
the said unlawful taking consisting of the unlawful creation of claims against the United States Treasury to the extent of over $80 billion dollars in the year 1928, and I charge them with similar thefts committed in 1929, 1930, 1931, 1932, and 1933, and in years previous to 1928, amounting to billions of more dollars. And whereas I charge them jointly and severally with having unlawfully created claims against the United States Treasury, by unlawfully placing United States government credit in specific amounts to the credit of foreign governments and foreign central banks of issue, private interests and commercial and private banks of the United States and foreign countries and branches of foreign banks doing business in the United States, to the extent of billions of dollars, and with having made unlawful contracts in the name of the United States government and the United States Treasury, and with having made false entries on books of account, and whereas I charge them jointly and severally with having taken Federal Reserve notes from the United States Treasury, and with having issued Federal Reserve notes, and with having put Federal Reserve notes into circulation, without obeying the mandatory provision of the Federal Reserve Act which requires the Federal Board to fix an interest rate on all issues of Federal Reserve notes supplied to Federal Reserve Banks. The interest resulting therefrom to be paid by the Federal Reserve Banks to the Government of the United States for the use of the said Federal Reserve notes, and I charge them with having defrauded the United States government and the people of the United States of billions of dollars by the commission of this crime. And whereas I charge them jointly and severally with having purchased United States government securities with United States government credit unlawfully taken, and with having sold the said United States government securities back to the people of the United States for gold or gold values, and with having again purchased United States government securities with United States government credit unlawfully taken, and with having again sold the said United States government securities back to the people, of the United States government for gold or gold values, I charge them with having defrauded the United States by this rotary process, whereas I charge them, jointly and severally, with having unlawfully negotiated United States government securities upon which the government's liability was extinguished as collateral security for the Federal Reserve notes, and with having by this process defrauded the United States government and the people of the United States, and I charge them with the theft of all the gold and Federal Reserve currency they obtained by this process, and whereas I charge them jointly and severally with having unlawfully issued Federal Reserve currency on false, worthless, and fictitious acceptances and other circulating evidences of debt, and with having made unlawful advancements of Federal Reserve currency, and with having unlawfully permitted renewals of acceptances and renewals of other circulating evidences of debt, and with having permitted acceptance bankers and discount dealer corporations and other private bankers to violate the banking laws of the United States. And whereas I charge them jointly and severally with having conspired to have evidences of debt to the extent of over one billion dollars artificially created at the end of February 1933 and early in March 1933, and with having made unlawful issues and advancement 
of Federal Reserve currency on the security of the said artificially created evidences of debt for a sinister purpose. And with having assisted in the execution of the said sinister purpose, and whereas I charge them, jointly and severally, with having brought about a repudiation of the currency obligations of the Federal Reserve Banks to the people of the United States, and with having conspired to obtain a release for the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks from their contractual liability to redeem all Federal Reserve currency in gold or lawful money, at any Federal Reserve Bank, and with having conspired to have the debts and losses of the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks unlawfully transferred to the government and the people of the United States, and whereas I charge them jointly and severally with having unlawfully substituted Federal Reserve currency and other irredeemable paper currency for gold in the hands of the people, after the decision to repudiate the Federal Reserve currency and the national currency was made known to them, and with having thus obtained money under false pretenses, and whereas I charge them jointly and severally with having brought about a repudiation of the national currency of the United States. <laughs> Tell us how you really feel, Congressman McFadden. Right on in order that the gold value of the said currency might be given to private interests, foreign governments, foreign central banks of issue, and the bank for international settlements. And whereas I charge them, jointly and severally, with conniving with the edge law banks and other edge law institutions, accepting banks and discount corporations, unlawfully to finance foreign governments, foreign corporations, and foreign individuals with funds unlawfully taken from the United States Treasury, and I charge them with having unlawfully permitted and made possible a mass financing of foreigners at the expense of the United States Treasury to the extent of billions of dollars, and with having unlawfully permitted and made possible the bringing into the United States of immense quantities of foreign securities created in foreign countries for export to the United States and with having unlawfully permitted the said foreign securities to be imported into the United States instead of gold which was lawfully due to the United States on trade and balances and otherwise and with having unlawfully permitted and facilitated the sale of the said foreign securities in the United States in a manner prejudicial to the public welfare and inimical to the government of the United States, and whereas I charge them jointly and severally with having unlawfully made loans of gold and of gold values belonging to the bank depositors, and the general public of the United States to foreign governments, foreign central banks of issue, foreign commercial banks, foreign corporations, and individuals, and the bank for international settlements, to the loss and detriment of the government and the people of the United States. And whereas I charge them jointly and severally, with having unlawfully exported gold reserves belonging to the National Bank depositors and gold belonging to the general public of the United States to foreign countries, and with having converted the said gold into foreign currencies, and with having used it for the benefit of foreigners and for speculative purposes abroad, and with having unlawfully converted to the United States, stored or held in foreign countries, and with having unlawfully prevented the shipment to the United States of the said gold which was due to the United States, and with having permitted the importation under their supervision of false, worthless, and fictitious trade paper 
and foreign securities of doubtful value in lieu of it, and with having caused the United States to lose the said gold. And whereas I charge them jointly and severally with having unlawfully exported United States coins and currency for a sinister purpose, and with having deprived the people of the United States of their lawful circulating medium of exchange, and I charge them with having arbitrarily and unlawfully reduced the amount of money and currency in circulation in the United States to the lowest rate per capita in the history of the government, so that the great mass of the people have been left without a sufficient medium of exchange. And I charge them with concealment and evasion in refusing to make known the amount United States money in coins and paper currency exported abroad, and the amount remaining in the United States, as a result of which refusal the Congress of the United States is unable to ascertain where the United States coins and issues of currency are at the present time, and what amount of United States currency is now held abroad. And whereas I charge them jointly and severally with having arbitrarily and unlawfully raised and lowered the rates on money, and with having arbitrarily increased and diminished the volume of currency in circulation for the benefit of private interests and foreign speculators at the expense of the government and the people of the United States, and with having unlawfully manipulated money rates, wages, salaries, and property values, both real and personal, in the United States, by unlawful operations in the open discount market, and by resale and repurchase agreements unsanctioned by law. And whereas I charge them jointly and severally with having brought about the decline in prices on the New York Stock Exchange, and other exchanges, in October 1929, by unlawful manipulation of money rates and volume of United States money and currency in circulation. Why isn't this taught in school? Why isn't this speech taught in schools? This speech by Congressman Lewis McFadden. I know why. By thefts of funds from the United States Treasury. By gambling in acceptances and United States government securities, by services rendered to foreign and domestic speculators and politicians, and by the unlawful sale of United States gold reserves, and whereas I charge that the unconstitutional inflation law embedded in the so-called Farm Relief Act, by which the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks are given permission to buy United States government securities to the extent of $3 billion and to draw forth currency from the people's treasury to the extent of $3 billion is likely to result by connivance on the part of the said accused with others in the purchase by the Federal Reserve Banks of the United States Government Securities, to the extent of three billion dollars, with the United States' own credit unlawfully taken, it being obvious that the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks do not intend to pay anything of value to the United States Government for the said United States Government Securities, no provision for payment in gold or lawful money appearing in the so-called Farm Relief Act. Parenthesis, James Montgomery writes, Here, Congressman McFadden is telling you that payment in anything but gold or silver is of no real value and is not lawful money. End parenthesis. Back to the words of McFadden and that the United States government will thus be placed in the position of conferring a gift of $3 billion 
in United States government securities on the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks to enable them to pay more of their bad debts to foreign governments, foreign central banks of issue, private interests, and private and commercial banks, both foreign and domestic, and the Bank for International Settlements, and whereas the United States government will thus go into debt to the extent of three billion dollars in currency unlawfully created against it, and whereas no private interests should be permitted to buy United States government securities with the government's own credit unlawfully taken, and whereas currency should not be issued for the benefit of the said private interests, or any interests on United States government securities so acquired, and whereas it has been publicly stated and not denied that the inflation amendment to the Farm Relief Act is the matter of benefit which was secured by Ramsay MacDonald, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, upon the occasion of his latest visit to the White House and the United States Treasury, and whereas there is grave danger that the accused will employ the provision creating United States government securities to the extent of three billion dollars and three billion dollars in currency to be issuable thereupon for the benefit of themselves and their foreign principles, and that they will convert the currency so obtained to the uses of Great Britain by secret arrangements with the Bank of England, of which they are the agents, and for which they maintain an account and perform services at the expense of the United States Treasury, and that they will likewise confer benefits upon the Bank for International Settlements, for which they maintain an account and perform services at the expense of the United States Treasury. And whereas I charge them, jointly and severally, with having unlawfully concealed the insolvency of the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks, and with having failed to report the insolvency of the Federal Reserve Banks to the Congress, and with having conspired to have the said insolvent institutions continue in operation, and with having permitted the said insolvent institutions to receive United States government funds and other deposits, and having permitted them to exercise control over the gold reserves of the United States, and with having permitted them to transfer upwards of one hundred billion dollars of their debts and losses to the general public and the government of the United States, and with having permitted foreign debts of the Federal Reserve Banks to be paid with the property, the savings, the wages, and the salaries of the people of the United States, and with the farms and homes of the American people, and whereas I charge them with forcing the bad debts of the Federal Reserve Banks upon the general public covertly and dishonestly, and with taking the general wealth and savings of the people of the United States under false pretenses to pay the debts of the Federal Reserve Banks to foreigners, and whereas I charge them jointly and severally with failure to protect and maintain the gold reserves and the gold stock and gold coinage of the United States, and with having sold the gold reserves of the United States to foreign governments, foreign central banks of issue, foreign commercial and private banks, and other foreign institutions and individuals at a profit to themselves, and I charge them with having sold gold reserves of the United States so that between 1924 and 1928 the United States gained no gold on net account, but suffered a decline in its percentage of central gold reserves 
from 45.9% in 1924 to 37.5% in 1928, notwithstanding the fact that the United States had a favorable balance of trade throughout that period. And whereas the United States was the only country which lost a considerable quantity of gold during that period, to wit, 1924 to 1928 inclusive, I charged them with the theft and sale of the said gold to their foreign principals, and I charged them with the theft and sale of 10% of the entire gold stock of the United States during the last four months of 1927 and during 1928, after crediting all importations of gold received by the United States during that period, this theft and sale of 10% of the gold stock of the United States occasioned the largest gold outflow from the United States that had theretofore occurred. And I charged them with the theft and sale of all the gold reserves exported from the United States from the year 1928 to the present time, a period during which the United States has lost gold continuously and has gained no gold on net account, notwithstanding the fact that the balance of trade and accounts throughout the entire period has been in favor of the United States. And whereas the United States has received no gold on net account since 1923, a period of ten years during which the United States has had a favorable balance of trade and has had large sums due to it and payable in gold from foreign nations and has not received such sums in gold, I charge them, the said accused, with the theft of gold belonging to the United States and with the unlawful diversion of United States gold to the treasuries and central banks of foreign countries, and I charge them with concealment of the true condition and amount of the gold reserves of the United States. Man, is this ever memory hold history. This memory hold speech right here. Wow. I never heard this. You guys ever heard this before? Everybody should know about this. This congressman had the guts to stand up and accuse the bankers of stealing our gold. It's right here. And this is right before the 29 crash. Wow. Erased history. Continuing. And whereas I charge them jointly and severally, and with having fictitiously paid installments on the national debt with government credit unlawfully taken, and whereas I charge them jointly and severally, with the loss of United States government funds entrusted to their care, and whereas I charge them jointly and severally with having destroyed independent banks in the United States, and with having thereby caused losses amounting to billions of dollars to the depositors of the said banks and to the general public of the United States, and whereas I charge them jointly and severally with failure to furnish true reports of the business operations and the condition of the Federal Reserve Banks to the Congress and the people, and with having furnished false and misleading reports to the Congress of the United States, and whereas I charge them jointly and severally with having published false and misleading propaganda intended to deceive the American people and to cause the United States to lose its independence. And whereas I charge them jointly and severally with having entered into secret agreements and illegal transactions with Montague Norman, governor of the Bank of England. And whereas I charge them jointly and severally with swindling the United States Treasury and the people of the United States 
in pretending to have received payment from Great Britain of the amount due on the British war debt to the United States in December 1932. <laughs> like they're really going to pay that. They're our masters. <laughs> We're still their colony. Yeah, that, that's what James Montgomery would prove in his next book after this. Continuing. And whereas I charge them jointly and severally with having conspired with their foreign principals and others to defraud the United States government and to prevent the people of the United States from receiving payment of the war debts due to the United States from foreign nations, and whereas I charge them jointly and severally with having robbed the United States government and the people of the United States by their theft and sale of the gold reserve of the United States and other unlawful transactions, and with having created a deficit in the United States Treasury, which has necessitated to a large extent the destruction of our national defense and the reduction of the United States Army and the United States Navy and other branches of the national defense, and whereas I charge them jointly and severally with having reduced the United States from a first-class power to one that is dependent, and with having reduced the United States from a rich and powerful nation to one that is internationally poor. And whereas I charge them jointly and severally with the crime of having treasonably conspired and acted against the peace and security of the United States, and with having treasonably conspired to destroy constitutional government in the United States, therefore be it resolved that the Committee on the Judiciary is authorized and directed as a whole or by subcommittee to investigate the official conduct of Eugene Meyer, Roy A. Young, Edmund Platt, Eugene R. Black, Adolph Casper Miller, Charles S. Hamlin, George R. James, Andrew W. Melton, Osden L. Mills, William H. Wooden, John W. Pohl, J. F. T. O'Connor, members of the Federal Reserve Board, and F. H. Curtis, J. H. Case, R. L. Austin, George DeCamp, L. B. Williams, W. W. Hoxton, Oscar Newton, E. M. Stevens, J. S. Wood, J. N. Payton, M. L. McClure, C. C. Walsh, Isaac B. Newton, Federal Reserve Agents, to determine whether, in the opinion of the said committee, they have been guilty of any high crime or misdemeanor which, in the contemplation of the Constitution, requires the interposition of the constitutional powers of the House. Such committee shall report its findings to the House, together with such resolution or resolutions of impeachment or other recommendations as it deems proper. For the purposes of this resolution, the committee is authorized to sit and act during the present Congress, at such times and places in the District of Columbia or elsewhere, whether or not the House is sitting, has recessed, or has adjourned, to hold such clerical, stenographic, and other assistance, to require the attendance of such witnesses, and the production of such books, papers, and documents, to take such testimony, to have such printing and binding done, and to make such expenditures as it deems necessary. Congressional Record, 73rd Congress, Second Session, Franklin D. Roosevelt, the Apostle of Irredeemable Paper Money, Speech of Honorable Louis T. McFadden 
of Pennsylvania. In the House of Representatives, Wednesday, January 24, 1934. Mr. McFadden, Mr. Chairman, a citizen of the United States has asked me to explain for his benefit and for the benefit of other United States citizens the real meaning of the Roosevelt Gold Bill. Okay, so this is still Lewis McFadden talking. The bill which the House passed last Saturday by 360 votes to 40, with 32 members not voting. Mr. Chairman, a law against the Constitution is void. The gold bill creates a nullity. Old John Marshall said that the words of the Constitution are not to be twisted out of their plain everyday meaning. The Constitution says Congress shall have power to coin money and to regulate the value thereof. This, Mr. Chairman, means that Congress has power to make coins of metal and to stamp the true value upon each one of them. It does not mean that Congress shall refuse to furnish the people of the United States with an adequate coinage. And it does not mean that a theoretical amount of uncoined metal shall be called a coin. A coin is an object which may be seen and felt and even heard if one tests the ring of it. Mr. Chairman, the gold bill attempts to cut out, delete, and destroy that part of our great written Constitution pertaining to the power of Congress to coin money and to regulate. That is, to stamp on the metal coin the value thereof. The bill is unconstitutional on its face because it seeks to nullify the Constitution. Moreover, it is a bill which is contrary to the common law and to the law of custom upon which the common law rests. It attempts to legalize robbery. It attempts by force to deprive the people of the United States of their right to the currency of the Constitution. It gives the international bankers power to send the gold belonging to the people of the United States to a place of deposit reserved to themselves in Europe. Mr. Chairman, the gold bill cannot become a valid law by any constitutional means. Now, Mr. Chairman, let us look at the bill to see if the legal hirelings of the Bank of England and their agents, the Federal Reserve Board, Lewis McFadden had it down. He nailed it. He knew it back in the early 1930s, folks. Congressman Lewis McFadden knew that the Federal Reserve was not the apex of the great scam and that the Federal Reserve Board, were, they were just the agents of the Bank of England that you had to follow the pyramid of power up through to the Bank of England. Of course, we know you can follow it up still to Rome today. Uh, continuing with McFadden's words, the legal hirelings of the Bank of England and their agents, the Federal Reserve Board, and the Federal Reserve Banks have been able to disguise its purpose. Let us see if they were able to clothe the grisly skeleton of their greed with echoes of glib religiosity according to the fashion set by the present administration. The first thing that meets my eye is the title. We read, A Bill to Protect the Currency of the United States to Provide for a Better Use of the Monetary Stock of the United States and for Other Purposes. It is indeed a bill to protect the present currency system of the United States, but it is a bill to protect it from the just wrath of the United States citizens. It is a bill to save for the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks their gigantic monopoly of a special paper currency which they steal from the Treasury 
and upon which they charge the people of the United States a heavy toll of interest. It is indeed a bill to provide for a better use of the monetary gold stock of the United States, if better use means the issuance of two sets of obligations against one piece of security. It is indeed a bill for other purposes, and those are purposes which the proponents dare not mention. Among the purposes of the gold bill not mentioned in the title is that of pretending to take into the Treasury the gold now held by the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks, and a great effort has been made to have it appear that the Federal Reserve Banks are unwilling to surrender the gold they now hold to the United States Treasury. This effort is dishonest for two reasons. First, the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks have already made a profit of some billions of dollars out of the President's gold seizures, and those billions were stolen from the people of the United States. And second, the transfer is fictitious. The President sought to convince members of Congress that the Federal Reserve Banks were resisting his efforts to have the Treasury take possession of the gold. But one of the members of the Federal Reserve Board spoiled that argument by declaring that the Federal Reserve Board had asked the President to have the Treasury take the gold. You see, Mr. Chairman, under this bill, the United States Treasury has to pay for the gold. Although the gold belongs to the people and was taken away from their bank deposits and their cash registers and their pocketbooks in the first place and put into the Federal Reserve Banks. And although the Federal Reserve Banks tricked and fooled the people into giving it to them, for Federal Reserve currency, which they now refuse to redeem. And although that gold does not belong to the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks, the United States Treasury has to pay the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks for it. Well, how does this bill propose to pay the Federal Reserve outfit? How does this bill provide that the government shall take over the stolen goods. It provides that the United States government shall give the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks new gold certificates to the full value of the loot. The gold certificates will give the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks legal title to the gold, and the United States Treasury will be nothing more than its physical custodian. The Secretary of the Treasury will give the Federal Reserve Banks gold for their new gold certificates whenever they ask for it. It is a fraudulent transfer. When the individual citizens of the United States were acquired to surrender their gold, they were acquired to surrender their gold certificates as well as their gold coin and bullion. The Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve banks are private corporations, but they did not obey the gold orders. They did not surrender any gold coin, gold certificates, or gold bullion. On the contrary, why, this is such a great point. Why hasn't anybody else brought this up since then? On the contrary, the gold which was commandeered from the people was given to them as a free gift. And now, after they have taken into their possession all the gold belonging to the people, they are ready to make a pretended transfer of that gold to the government. Evidently, there is law for the common man and no law for the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks. The common man must toe the mark, but the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks are the agents of the Bank of England. And the law, it seems, does not apply to them. Many of the officials of the Federal Reserve outfit have had charges of impeachment brought against them, but those charges have not been investigated. 
The Federal Reserve outfit now has in its possession gold coin, gold certificates, and gold bullion. But this bill does not require them to surrender their present holdings of gold certificates. After this bill becomes law, if such a catastrophe should occur, <laughs> and it did occur, the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks will still hold their present gold certificates. They may exchange those gold certificates for gold between the time this bill becomes law and the day the president makes his proposed devaluation proclamation. Is not this gift of over one billion dollars in gold a great treasure to bestow upon the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks, the corrupt and sinister organization which has bankrupted the country? Does this not make favorites of the financial crooks who control it? Mr. Chairman, all the gold in the possession of the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks belongs to the people of the United States. During the last twenty years, under the vicious Federal Reserve Act, they have taken it from the people in exchange for Federal Reserve currency and it has not cost them one penny. Now they come forward to make a pretended transfer of the people's gold coin and bullion to the United States Treasury. Not one penny of the gold they pretend to transfer to the United States Treasury is owned by them. Every dollar of it belongs to the individual citizens of the United States. The United States Treasury is to buy it on credit and to pay for it with new gold certificates. How does this transfer title to the United States Treasury? Can the Congress lend itself to such a transaction? Last May I stated that, in my opinion, the people's gold, unjustly impounded in the Federal Reserve Banks, should be placed in the people's treasury, but I did not state that it should be placed there as the property of the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks to be withdrawn by them with gold certificates and to be made exportable from the United States Treasury to the Bank for International Settlements in Europe. What this bill proposes to do in connection with the President's message, suggesting that this United States gold may be sent to Europe to be kept in the Bank for International Settlements with the loot of the central banks of other countries is one of the greatest fiscal frauds in history. It is one of the biggest swindles of all time. Again, Mr. Chairman, as you very well know, the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks had paper currency outstanding to the extent of about five billion dollars when the present administration came into power. That currency was redeemable in gold. It constituted the people's title to all the gold held by the Federal Reserve outfit. It constituted a first and paramount lien on all the assets of the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks, instead of taking over the gold and the assets of the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks, including the great hoard of United States wealth which they have hidden in foreign countries, and honestly administering those assets for the benefit of the people who have been defrauded by the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks, from their legal liability to redeem their Federal Reserve currency in gold, or in lawful money convertible into gold, and from the surrender of all their assets. Every dollar 
that was unlawfully taken from the people of the United States by Roosevelt's gold order was given to the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks in preparation for this great steal, this wholesale robbery of the masses for the benefit of the privileged few. And now that American citizens have lost their gold, an entirely fictitious transfer has been arranged to deceive the people. Mr. Chairman, the President may underrate the mental capacity of the American people as much as he likes, but I venture to say there is no man in the United States so dumb that he cannot understand how this bill tricks and deceives him. The Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks have profited to the extent of five billion dollars or more by being released from their obligation to redeem their outstanding five billion dollars of paper Federal Reserve currency in gold. They have profited by having had over a billion dollars in gold certificates saved to them. They have profited during the last twenty years by the criminality of the Federal Reserve Board, which never charged them one penny in interest on the great mass of Federal Reserve currency they have taken from the government. They have profited from their own wrongdoing by the unlawful creation of fictitious claims against the United States government and the giving of those claims to foreigners, and they have profited by their control of all the public revenues. And now they come forward with a scheme to sell the gold they have taken from the American people to the Treasury for new gold certificates which will give them a legal title to that gold and permit them to do as they please with it. An era of corruption is culminating in one of the greatest crimes that has ever been perpetrated against the people. Mark my words, Mr. Chairman, there will be trouble here if this bill becomes law. Why, Mr. Chairman, this is fiscal fraud. This crime is so stupendous that the instigators and manipulators of it did not dare to have all the transactions performed by one man. Each man did his part and then got out of Washington, pretending that he disagreed with the President's money policy or pretending he was ill. William H. Wooden, who sat beside Albert H. Wigan on the board of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and who acquiesced in and helped to perpetrate the financial misdeeds which bankrupted the country, is now hiding in a western sanitarium. Dr. Sprague, the tool of the international bankers, and an employee of the Bank of England, was, in my opinion, put into the Treasury to resign at a certain time and to create uncertainty in the minds of the people by the manner of his going and his subsequent articles pleading for sound money. Mr. Chairman, all the bickering and the resignations and the artful propaganda that has been thrown around the monetary policy of Franklin D. Roosevelt cannot disguise the fact that he was selected by the international bankers. Wow, he's calling it like it is. This is in the congressional record, folks. It's all right here. This is a congressman saying this. Franklin D. Roosevelt cannot disguise the fact that he was selected by the international bankers to carry on the work they started with the Great Depression, that is, the pauperization of the masses and the seizure of American property for their own use and benefit. This is why they assassinated Congressman Lewis McFadden, and this is why they memory hold the history of that assassination. You'll never see a, a movie made out of Congressman Lewis McFadden's life. You should, though. Continuing. And that he has lent himself to their schemes by unconstitutionally demanding and 
assuming the dictatorial powers which will enable him to carry them out. Another purpose of this bill not mentioned in the title is the transference of a very large quantity of United States gold to the Bank for International Settlements. One of the chief objects of the gold policy of the present administration is the sending of gold taken by force from its lawful American owners to the Bank for International Settlements in Europe, where it will be kept with the property of the central banks of the world. According to the Hague Convention, under which the Bank of International Settlements was formed, gold deposits in the vaults of the Bank for International Settlements is safe from seizure. Our gold, when it goes there, will certainly be safe from seizure by the United States. The Bank of International Settlements is dominated by the Bank of England. It is not on American soil. It is in Europe. American gold, therefore, will be kept in Europe. It will be placed where none of the wage slaves of the United States will ever be able to acquire any of it. It will be the capital and means of oppression of that international superstate, that financial superstate which has been, after Uncle Sam's gold money, ever since the wealth of this country attracted the attention of greedy European bankers and brought them flocking over here to set up the suction pumps of the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks. Wow! McFadden! Whew, he's, firing on, he's, he's firing on all cylinders here. Lewis McFadden is really the unknown, unsung hero of the American Congress. Wow. So they slipped him some arsenic. Yes, they did. Like they tried to do with President James Buchanan and ended up killing several and hurting many, many more in his inaugural party. But that's been memory hold from history, too, you see. That's why you never heard of that either. Continuing, the Bank for International Settlements is an international banker's bank. It is a central bank of central banks. The international bankers who brought about the Depression have been drawing gold to themselves from the common people of every land. It is their intention to use that gold for their own purposes. They propose two kinds of money. Gold, the real money, is what they intend to have for themselves. And paper money, which has no intrinsic value in itself, and which is made out of nothing, and is worth nothing, unless it can be redeemed by the holder in gold, that is, for the common people, or, as they call us, the peasants. Franklin D. Roosevelt, the high priest of repudiation, the apostle of irredeemable paper money, and the man who intends to send United States gold out of the United States to a place where no American citizen can claim it, this Franklin D. Roosevelt characterizes all those who do not agree with his monetary policy as mules. If that is true, what an awful mule President Woodrow Wilson must have been. Concerning Andrew Jackson, Wilson said, he had no idea of allowing the country to undertake the fatal experiment of an irredeemable paper currency. All right, folks, this will end it for this part. Part four of A Country Defeated in Victory by James Montgomery. Uh, we will pick it up next time with the last installment, part five of, of this book. And uh, we will continue with this incredible speech by uh, Congressman Lewis McFadden that has been purged <laughs> in almost every quarter of any kind of history you would ever learn about this country. It's been memory hold. Uh, okay, this does it for part four. Once again, this has been uh, 
A Country Defeated in Victory by James Montgomery. You've been listening to, <laughs> it has been memory hold and rejected. Um,